Um, so we're very happy to, to welcome uh, Dr. Marcos Rangel here. here. Uh, you may have seen him already around CPC. He's actually here this semester while he's spending, or the whole are you the semester of the year? Um, trying the year. Oh, excellent. Uh, so uh, he's here on sabbatical from Duke. So he's an associate professor uh, in the Stanford School of Public Policy with a joint appointment in uh, economics. Uh, he's affiliated with Duke Free, their pop center, uh, the Duke Global Health Institute, and the Child, uh, the Center for Child and Family Policy. So Marcos here is uh, an applied microeconomist and received his PhD from UCLA. Uh, and so when I was trying to figure out what kind of things he studies, I was like, wow, he studies it all. Uh, and so I couldn't just come up with like, here's his area. <laughs> uh, so he has worked, um, that's been published in a number of top journals in economics and demography. Uh, and he has worked on voting, on immigrants, on safety net programs, on environmental impacts and birth outcomes, and pretty much anything else you can think of, he's probably published on it. Uh, so with that, I will turn it over to him to talk about um, his current project. Thank you so much. I uh, really appreciate it. Thanks for the hospitality. Uh, it's, it's great to be here. Is that okay if I remove my mask? Are you guys comfortable with that? Sure. Uh, I'm just worried about projecting with the mask and, and all that. Uh, so thank you so much. Um, we're going to talk a little bit exactly about that. I start with a, a brief uh, history of why I got to the topics I'm working on and how I got there. And I think part of the message is that kids don't do it, don't, don't work on too many things. <laughs> I heard from Elizabeth this Wednesday that I'm crazy to be working on all that. But let me start saying that part of what you're going to see uh, today and the title of, of, of this talk is really uh, coming from a joint work with a Sanford graduate that's now at Syracuse. She is great. She's doing great work on education. So if your interest is in education, this is someone to follow and keep track of. She is super smart, super good. All right. Uh, thanks for the introduction, but I'm going to be a little bit of my introduction here. Uh, this accent is coming from Brazil, so born and raised in Brazil. And, and the countryside of Rio, not any interesting big city in Brazil and all that that you see in the movies. No, it's very boring city. Uh, uh, it happens to be a sugar cane growing area in Brazil and with a rich history of slavery as well. So there's uh, from childhood, there's this a sense of inequality and racial disparities that were quite clear uh, uh, to me. Uh, I came back, uh, I guess, almost naturally into my research agenda later. I uh, never thought about it until I got to, to, to doing it. Um, so uh, training uh, uh, in economics only, economics to the bone. So take that against me. Yes, I'm an economist. <laughs> Uh, I do have, though, a strong connection with Pop Center since my graduate uh, days at UCLA. That's where I met Elizabeth, by the way. And that was very important to, to, uh, to expose me to multiple disciplines. And that's what I like when I do my research is really to read outside economics. Uh, I like to be the economist, uh, but I like learning from other disciplines, and that uh, shows up in uh, uh, in my agenda at the end of the day. I call my agenda the economics of human capital. That gives me tremendous freedom to do whatever I want. Um, and once again, it's not advisable to start your career like that. Uh, um, but I guess I got to a point that I can't afford to do it. Uh, I'm an applied microeconomist. I really, really dig into data, but I do that taking seriously theory uh, uh, underneath and I try to, to make sense of what I'm doing. Most of my work, because I sit in a policy school, most of my work try to connect policy questions uh, and have policy recommendations, although not all the time I'm successful at doing that. Uh, if I can give you a quotation, so a lot of people also call me a developing economist, and I indeed think I am. This is coming from uh, T.W. Schultz, uh, uh, Nobel lecture in 1979. And this is, I would say, that's what's inspiring me to be the developing economist I am. This is really about a call to, to, to the idea that what really produces development and improvements in life conditions is really the improvement of the quality of the individuals. And that has many dimensions, education, health, and whatever you can imagine. So again, I'm just using this to, uh, to help out defend my position to why I work on the stuff I work. So for the research topic today, I'm going to start a long story. It's really a long story uh, because it starts way back then. And why I study uh, what I study comes from this idea of uh, my first interest in, in contrasting uh, racial differences in the US and uh, in Brazil. 
bringing my perspective into, into the U.S. Um, this, by the way, this is not a joke. This actually happened. Uh, George Bush actually asked the, the president of Brazil if we had blacks too. Uh, um, and was quite curious that we had blacks. Uh, uh, if, if you know a little bit more than him, you know that there, so we have plenty, uh, if not the majority of the population at this point. But then I had this interest in understanding what skin color or racial uh, identity had to do with social stratification by contrasting this to um, environments. I never got, got to do actually a comparative study at the end of the day, but I'm doing different studies and trying to make sense of it in separate articles. I guess uh, my professional orientation is to write articles. If I ever were to write a book, maybe I would do something like this. I, I don't think I'm going that way. Uh, but Brazil is interesting in particular because you see this uh, pretty clear, um, uh, you know, there's way less uh, segregation. There's a lot more interracial marriage and you get the sense that we live in a racial democracy in Brazil. Actually, this term has been used in Brazil quite, uh, quite a bit. Uh, but when you look at any socioeconomic uh, indicator, you're gonna see gaps that are as large as the US gaps, right? It's pretty equivalent at the end of the day that you see that. And I just think it's interesting to have these two things happening. Um, at the same time, and maybe I could learn from the two experiences if I were to think about them together. Not sure if I made much progress on that. Um, there's a lot of gaps that also happen within uh, any, if you look at any school outcome, um, actually you, see, you still see large gaps. Again, this mimics a little bit the US experience that the gaps uh, are already there when kids get into school and they either tend to get larger or they tend to stay the same. That's pretty much the story in Brazil as well. Uh, our data is way more recent because we have not been collecting uh, for, for that long um, data on, on student outcomes. Now, uh, why I got into this? Well, I got into this as a population economist through the lenses of family economics, right? I start thinking about this as, uh, if you are asking questions about racial differences, you may be in a situation that you want to understand if the underinvestment in human capital is coming through uh, poverty traps, you know, families that are disadvantaged cannot invest as much as they should in their kids, or they're coming also because they believe that there is no return to that investment uh, uh, in those kids, right? Uh, so uh, uh, my first step into this uh, a specific topic was really thinking about what if I have parents that have a choice to invest in kids that look like they belong to a racial group and kids that do not look like, or kids that uh, look like they belong to a different racial group, right? That they are perceived by others as members of different races, but they happen to be uh, two of your kids, right? Well, it turns out that in Brazil, we can actually pull it off. You can actually have this information because we have uh, data of racial identity in Brazil is reported at the individual level and with enough mixing of races and with enough, uh, uh, and genetics will basically give you a variation that is enough for you to have brothers or sisters that look like they belong to different racial groups. So a long time ago, I wrote this, this little paper that was actually inspired by Malcolm X uh, 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 saying that uh, his interactions with his dad were quite different from the interactions with uh, his other brothers or sisters, basically because at least he understood that his dad was being brainwashed by the idea that the lighter kid was better than the darker kids um, uh, in the family. And that was translating into differential treatment by parents. Once again, it's not that his dad loved him more or less, whatever, but it was perceiving messages coming from outside uh, and reacting to that information in a particular way. Okay? So I took that to data from Brazil, as I told you, with the variation that I have, and what comes out of it is that indeed there are a lot of the difference in terms of enrollment and investment in education on the five to 14 age range is coming from differences across families, as you would expect. Different social economic status generate different investment patterns. But it turns out that almost half of it is also happening within the family. Okay? 
uh, with siblings of different appearance. Okay, so there's this consistently a consistent finding across data sets in Brazil that you you see the darker skin kid receiving less investments from the parents than the lighter skin kid. Okay, this amounts to those numbers that I showed you. So the way I translate all the numbers at the end of the day there is that there is a 6.5 less chance of finishing primary education for a darker skin kid than the sibling with a lighter skin color. Okay. Uh, again, I'm not claiming the uh, parents uh, are not colorblind with their love. I'm just claiming that there's something about their decision to invest in their kids that's being guided by what society perceives as being racial identity at the end of the day. Well, that led me to the next question. And that's now I'm getting closer to what I'm talking about today, right? Now I'm thinking about where are the get parents getting this information from? Who's telling them that they should invest differentially in their kids? Okay, I'm presuming that they love them equally. How they receive this different inf different information? Well, you gotta understand that this is coming from uh, those perceptions are being formed from information that they're getting, most likely coming from this idea that parents are getting informed by specialists. The teachers at the school are telling the parents, "Your kid is good at it. Your kid is not good at it." I, this message is coming home from somewhere. It can come in a transcript, it can come in a letter, it can come in any recommendation, it can come in a conversation. But essentially, this is how I'm thinking about it. Right? Parents are now being informed. And my question then becomes, what if uh, you are generating those perceptions that are now being absorbed by parents and generating those equilibrium of underinvestment? Uh, uh, in a way that may be biased. So essentially my question became, are parents receiving information that is biased in any way and therefore leading them to underinvest in their kids, right? Of a particular racial appearance, okay? So once again, start a long time ago with a question about decisions within the families and became a question of assessment bias by teachers, okay? And that started a, a, a small sequence of, of, of papers that uh, I have worked on for, for a little while. Uh, and essentially, this is what I'm going to be focusing on today on discussing with you guys. Uh, it's talking about how does, uh, can I document, I, I guess I have, that's my list. So assessment bias, can I document uh, dimensions of differential treatment uh, 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 by teachers with respect to students of a certain uh, group? I will say one here because what you're gonna be seeing today is really one dimension of discrimination. I'm not claiming that I can measure all discriminatory action by teachers interacting with their students. I'm gonna tell you that I'm gonna pick one of them that I'm gonna be referring to as assessment bias. Okay? Uh, this is not to say that I don't believe that there's other differential treatment that will lead to differential learning trajectories that may be very well be there. But as you're gonna see how I put this together, I'm gonna to do all, what I'm gonna analyze is to measure the bias on top of that. Whatever is your learning trajectory, once I observe your learning trajectory, I wanna know if your teachers will still see you in a different way. Um, making sense? By the way, I didn't say anything, but you guys can interrupt me at any time, okay? Um, <clears throat> Um, so what, what they're going to be doing then is associating this assessment bias to characteristics of a teacher professional trajectory, uh, which I think is the contribution in the end of what we are doing now. Not only documenting that something exists, but trying to associate that, what exactly explains the existence, existence of that phenomenon. Right? Uh, that is a, that's in some sense very important for policy, because then you need to ask, okay, I know there is bias out there, how do I get to fix it is the next question, right? And understanding the process underneath is, is, is the important piece of the puzzle. What you want to see from me today is this idea, how much of this bias is affecting the trajectory of these kids. Uh, I believe there is an effect. There are people working on this out there. I may be going back to this at some, spot, some point, but not today, okay? So let's imagine that I'm working on a topic that's very important. There's big consequences of that, but I'm not showing you the consequences. Huh? All right. And as economists do, we tend to take something that's very simple and complicated. So here's a few few Greek letters and, and equations and all that. But I'm going to try to do this in words. Right? It's way simpler in words. 
suicide volume, volume is down to assessment bias. I just want to characterize the teacher as someone that is evaluating and trying to rank the kids. That's all the teacher in my scenario here is doing. I'm not claiming that this is the reality, but I'm highlighting this dimension of our work as teachers, by the way. We do great work, right? So essentially, when we are grading, we're doing something like this. And what I imagine here is a scenario that I have an information set, and I'm using that information set, how much I know about my students to classify their proficiency. Okay, and I have my definition of their proficiency, and they have their true proficiency. What I really wanted to do is to be do the best job at classifying that. When I am grading, I'm really interested in returning to you where how much you know exactly, and that turns out to be a minimization of error um, exercise, right? So I'm, I'm framing this teacher here as someone that minimizes square uh, prediction error. Right, pretty much an OLS, and an OLS is what you get at the end of the day as a solution to a simple problem like this. Now, what is the teacher doing at the end of the day? The teacher is collecting information about uh, her students along the way by designing tests, quizzes, exams, whatever. You are doing that and you're doing the sequence. Every time you're getting that, the signal of the proficiency of your student uh, obviously, the signal has some noise in it, so it's not a precise signal. You're collecting those along the way, and you're trying to uh, understand how good the, the student is. One thing that's important for me is that you cannot spend all the time evaluating your students to be as precise as you could be, right? You've got to teach some part of your time, uh, so there is a cap on how much you can test your students and collect information, and that's, that's what imposes almost a technological impediment for me to learn precisely how much my students know. Okay? Um, so uh, at the end of the day, whatever is my assessment of my students turns out in this problem to be a, a weighted sum of two elements. One element is the signal extraction technology, is how much I learn from my uh, exams and my grading process. That's the first half of it. The second half may be coming from the existence of priors that you have about certain groups within uh, um, uh, your population of students. Right? And that may very well be coming into this picture here in a very unconscious manner. Right? So when you read the literature of implicit association bias, the implicit association bias literature is really talking about some prior that you have in the back of your mind that's not conscious, but it may be finding its way in the way you evaluate people or you interact with them. Okay? And that's exactly what is showing on in this scenario. But I want to emphasize this too, because for me it's important in terms of understanding the process later on, if it's coming from here or if it's coming from here and what I can do to eliminate that, okay? So sorry for all the, the letters, but I, I hope the idea is, is making sense to most of you. At the end of the day, if I improve my technology of signal extraction, the prior doesn't matter. Your prior can be as biased as it can be, but if my technology is perfect, that becomes irrelevant, okay? At the same time, with imprecise technology or insufficient technology, any prior will show up at the end of the day. So I'm gonna show you two pieces of work that I have done. Uh, uh, well, the most recent is, is, is the second one, but the first one is really trying to focus on the Brazilian scenario and understand what if I have something that help, gives me variation in technology? Can I show to you that indeed bias will be removed from the picture if technology is improved? That's one, of, uh, uh, one article. The second article is really trying to think, where is this prior that I, I'm presuming is bias against certain groups is coming from, okay? And that is uh, going, uh, going to take us to the idea of the first impressions that's in the title of the talk. It's really about the experience of teachers, specific trajectories, professional trajectories, leading you to believe something different about your students today, okay? All right. Um, I guess I want, I want to spend time on this. I'll go back to this and illustrate a little bit in the end, okay? Uh, in practical terms, <clears throat> that whole thought process 
And that toy model at the end of the day leads to a specification that's an econometric specification that requires me to have a few things. It requires me to have some measure of those signals that teachers have. So I want to hold those signals constant okay? and try to imagine if my evaluation as a teacher will be a function of certain characteristics of the students, in particular, racial identity at the end of the day. Okay? So my process is entirely about if I compare two kids that have the same, give me the same signal, am I evaluating them differently depending on their racial identity? It's a very simple question of imagining that I can juxtapose two measures, the teacher measure of ability with a, a blindly scored measure of ability, right? That's essentially what this boils down to, okay? Everyone all right with that? Okay. Marcus, okay. Yes, yeah. Marcus. So sure. what, what is the incentive of teachers in this context to, to get the right measure of sustainability? Yeah, uh, not clear if that's the all the, that they really care about being right in the way I'm proposing here. Right. Um, I think that's an unsatis unsatisfactory model along uh, 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 um, with, with that question. It makes it a very unsatisfactory model because I can show to you if I have signs of these things being there. But if they are not there, I cannot tell you if this is coming from the teacher having a. I could have um, basically reframed this, this um, model to be teachers prefer to be right for a certain group, right? But that puts me away from this idea of informational uh, source of discrimination and puts me closer to the sentiment version of, uh, of discrimination, right? Uh, for those that know the language in economics literature on this, this is really about taste discrimination versus statistical discrimination, right? Uh, so what I'm framing here is a model that's plainly a statistical discrimination. If I find that whatever this implies is not really there, then the difference must be coming from sentiment. And that puts me in another, in another situation. Okay, but no, this, there's nothing in practice. If your question is in practice, can I guarantee to you that teachers are actually doing this in terms of this is how they perceive their evaluation job? I don't think I can show you any of that. I would imagine that there's some accountability if teachers are egregious on the discrimination of rating. I, because I would presume that will have some consequences. If if you're too obvious, you're too obvious on assigning rates according to racial identity. I think there are processes in this country, maybe not on mine, but in this country, I, I can see that having consequences, and I presume teachers are aware of that. Okay, but again, I have nothing to prove that. Yes. How do you control for the ability of the kid? That's the interesting. So this, this is coming from what I'm going to tell you is that I have the standardized test scores that cover the exact same curriculum, but are graded by a machine, right? And that sets the tone for me. This, is, this would be the signal if the teacher were to apply an exam in class. So it's emulating what I have in that simple model, okay? Uh, but the question then becomes, if I have two students that perform exactly the same on a standardized test, why are the teachers evaluating them differently according to the racial identity? Okay, is, is that answering your question? Yeah, kind of, but that already reflects the investment that the parent puts in the kids, yeah, right? Exactly. It, and it, it reflects the other investments that the teacher herself has put on the kids in the classroom. And that's that's why I told you beforehand that I can tell you about evaluation bias. I cannot tell you about racial bias of teachers more generally. Okay? That, that I cannot do. What you can, uh, if you want to fit to my story at the beginning, what I'm imagining here is that there's a sequencing of events. And you're right in saying that whatever is the score of the student is a function of the investments that were made during that school year, right? So we imagine that we are, we are getting this at the end of the school year, right? So this is my stock of knowledge being evaluated in two different ways, by a human and by a machine, say, right? Um, and obviously the investment happened there. My question is more about what is the information that's going back to parents at the end of this school year? 
is the information going back to parents bias in a way that next year I'm going to invest differential. That's how I'm thinking about it. Okay. But is this is more related to my the limitations of the data that I have. If I could observe the whole sequencing of events uh, and I could observe every interaction between teachers and students and teachers and parents and all information that flows, that will be fantastic. I, I simply do not have that. I think that would be an interesting exercise to conduct, but I don't have that. Uh, so I mean, imagine this is what I can give you about assessment bias at end of year zero, and that I presume will influence the decisions of investment in year one. Making sense? But as I will emphasize this, because this is a clear limitation of what I can say about this creation, right? This is conditional on the fact that they are performing at a certain level and they are performing at a certain level as a function of all the other actions that happen in the classroom. I'm not capturing that, unfortunately, right? This is not to claim that those things do not happen. Um, actually, imagine if you're biased on evaluation, you're probably biased in other dimensions as well. It just happens that I can show you bias in evaluation. I cannot show you the other patterns. Okay. Um, so that's the game. Now, uh, let me use your question because you, your question was really about how I'm measuring this, but you should be worried about other things that I do not measure that feel that go into the evaluation that teachers have for students, right? Um, what I'm presuming here is that I want to evaluate you on your math knowledge according to how much you know of math. But what if when I'm evaluating that, I'm also looking at other characteristics? It could be social emotional behavior filters into how teachers evaluate students. I think that's very reasonable to consider. So take what I can show you with a grain of salt, although I have parallel evidence that tells you that social emotional development does not explain away the gaps that uh, we measure here, okay? But keep that in mind. I think that's that's a good question to keep uh, asking this data for sure. So let me illustrate this is with two examples, as I told you. I have one example from Brazil and one example from North Carolina, okay? Um, so this is essentially an illustration of two uh, groups. This is how you see the score in mathematics in this case, how proficient you are on a test that is graded without the racial identity being uh, known, right? This is basically a machine grades your test. This is the assessment by the teachers. What you see across the board here, that no matter what is the level of proficiency according to the test, there is a gap that shows up uh, that teachers are over evaluating. And this is always in relative terms, by the way over evaluating relative to the black students, whites are being, uh, sorry, whites are being over, over evaluated uh, relative to blacks uh, throughout the distribution of scores. Uh, and that's that's now an old uh, paper. Uh, in North Carolina, you see something that's very similar. The scales obviously are not the same. Uh, the scales in North Carolina, as I'm gonna tell you, is really a one to four scale. And this is still a Z score uh, in the X axis here. But the patterns are not that they're that different. You're gonna still see there. Sorry if the colors flip, by the way. Uh, but yes, yeah, to keep you paying attention to what's going on. Yeah. Uh, uh, but essentially, the whites are still being over evaluated relative to the blacks uh, throughout uh, the distribution of tests. Maybe a little less here, but there's a lot of noise on the extremes anyway. Yes, please. Do you find that the gap is bigger or smaller as they age? Uh, this is interesting, right? So this is uh, this is eighth graders in Brazil. These are fourth and fifth graders in North Carolina. Uh, I have to confess to you that the only answer that I can give you is for Brazil. I haven't looked at older um, um, kids in North Carolina yet. Uh, what you see for fourth graders is as big as this one. I didn't see much of a change over this. Uh, and I only have in Brazil fourth graders and eighth graders. Okay. Uh, I do not have the finer uh, um, uh, comparison there. But this is something I plan on, on, on going in that direction with North Carolina. The reason I don't see much is that it turns out that North Carolina data, uh, and this, you guys may know more than I do, but, but essentially, as I keep working on it, the more I work, the more I learn. And I learned that 
the identification of teacher responsible for the kids on NCRDC data is way better for elementary school than it is for middle school and high school. Uh, especially when you take to when you start crossing data sets based on standardized tests and classroom assignment, those things are way clearer when you have elementary school kids than when you have uh, uh, older kids. So I took a step back on from, from looking at the global population and focus on elementary school. That's one, one motivation for that. The second motivation, this is a subsample of the entire population of, of uh, teachers in the system because I'm looking at novice teachers only. That's another thing that's gonna be important for me because the novice teachers are the ones for which I have good information about their history into the system. And that history, professional history into the system is what I'm using to leverage my discussion later on today. Is, it, is this math too? This is, uh, this is in fact filing up math and language. This is not, uh, you're gonna see if I were to split, but they will be exactly the same for language. Okay. Uh, and I should have told you this before. I, uh, uh, wrong order, sorry. Um, essentially, what you saw was uh, end of the year grades. This is transcript information that comes back in Brazil. Okay? It's the actual information that goes to parents. In North Carolina, it's not exactly the transcript information. It turns out that in the years I'm looking, when the state applied the exam, the standardized exam, it also sent the teachers a questionnaire in which they had to evaluate students uh, in the four levels, right? One, two, three, four, okay? And they were giving specific instructions that they should evaluate the student on the, uh, on the understanding of the subject. It was not about anything else. It was not about social emotional development. I'm not claiming that they did in those way. I'm claiming that they were instructed to do in those way. So in that sense, this is likely different than what uh, the Brazil exercise because of Brazil. I would assume this is an evaluation that's more global about the student, and this uh, is more specific about subject knowledge. Okay. Now, if I put those two next to each other, now in a regression format, you saw a figure that illustrates the differences. This is. Uh, the full-blown model without the other parts of the model, by the way. This is holding constant a bunch of other things that take the place of social emotional development. It takes a lot of uh, uh, information and holds that constant and only zooms in on the evaluation responding to task force, as you would expect, better performance in task force, better evaluation from teachers, so the teachers are responding. Uh, uh, to, um, to that performance. But you consistently see across these two scenarios uh, under evaluation of blacks. Uh, again, this is relative to the white classmate on the same ear, okay? So this is someone that was sitting next to you in the classroom. Essentially, that's a concert there. Uh, I always like to do this a scale three uh, comparison because remember, this is, this is one scale, this is another. The, the way I do scale three is really the ratio of these two numbers. And I read that as the size of the gap corresponds to four standard deviations, 0.04 standard deviations on this scale. It's as if I were taxing my black students by 4% of my standard deviation when, when they take an exam. That's what corresponds to my under evaluation of that. Uh, this will be the equivalent for North Carolina there. Okay. So this is just to, I, I know it's probably not satisfactory, but this is just to tell you that there, the gap is there and the gap seems to be there, even if I control for a bunch of other things. Uh, one side note is that when, I, as I told you, when I have a battery, so this is data that I collected myself, uh, about 30,000 students uh, uh, and have a battery of social emotional development indicators in there. Um, I could not explain away the racial gap with a social emotional development. That's not making that gap disappear. The evaluation differences are still there, even after a whole cost. I know the graph is probably not that uh, informative by the way, but so these are the gaps without control and with control. Okay, let me focus on the racial work. And then I decompose those differences here, right? So how much of 
this going from here to here was explained by different elements of my covariate set. Okay? Most of the difference is explained by proficiency, it's the test score. The test score is really explaining uh, the raw gap in evaluation. Uh, maybe 10% is going for social and emotional development, but what I'm trying to claim here is that even if I take that, the gap does not disappear. The gap still exists. So I'm comparing all kids that are similar in a bunch of dimensions and that. I like to leave the gender one here in X because it's the story is slightly different on gender. I think that's interesting. I, if, if I were to write another paper on this topic, I would probably put ratio and gender gaps together to, to, to this case because I think interesting differences. Yes. So yeah, I just wonder if you see the same pattern if you look at the teachers, white teachers and black teachers. That's a very interesting question. Unfortunately, it turns out that the proportion of the population of teachers that is black is small enough that I cannot get anything with, without huge noise. I think that's an essential question, right? So that's the first thing that jumps at you. And there are many reasons to believe that there may be uh, differences across racial identity of teachers and the way they evaluate black and white kids. Some of them are related to the taste of discrimination literature, if I may say, but some of them may be related to um, informational technology. So my ability to read more into certain cultural groups may be a function of my identity. So uh, I guess I'm taking too much time just to tell you that I don't have it uh, to show you. I, I apologize, but it's it's key. I would love to, to dig more into that. I just cannot pull it off. Um, so let, let me just uh, then wrap up the old paper. And I apologize that I just took the PDF and plug in in here uh, at the end. So I didn't do new tables for you guys. Uh, but essentially what I did for Brazil is that I look at what if I get some notion of, is the gap more prevalent among those? Uh, let me not show you because you got distracted if I show you the numbers. But essentially my question then became, uh, can I manipulate the technology of signal extraction, right? So that's, again, uh, going back to the way I'm thinking about this problem. Can I manipulate, can I find people that have access to different technology of signal extraction in my data set and show that the bias is prevalent among those that don't have a, technology, a good technology, and the bias disappears for those that have an improvement in technology. That's basically the question that I ask. Okay? Uh, now, obviously I don't have a clean variation on it, uh, but I do have a group of students that were exposed to the same teacher for two school years, relative to those that were exposed to the teacher only in one school year. What I'm thinking here is basically that the folks that have been with the same kids for a couple of years, they have more opportunities, they have more observations for every kid than the one that only observed for one year. Okay? So I just know more about that kid if I have seen this kid coming from fourth to fifth or coming from seventh to eighth grade. Okay. So my question then became, can that explain away the gaps that I'm, uh, I'm, I'm seeing on, on this evaluation? Well, it turns out that, lo and behold, if the teacher is interacting with the students over multiple years, I don't see any significant difference in the way the teacher evaluates black and white students. Those that perform at the certain level of the test are not being evaluated by teachers differentially according to race. All the effects I was showing you before is really coming from the folks that just got, well, and that's not right, but give me some room there, just got to know those kids. They have not had enough information to really identify what that kid is about. And that's where the priors can gain some uh, relevance on the evaluation and that shows up there. Um, as a good economist that likes uh, um, uh, preventing referees from dinging the paper, I did a bunch of robustness on this. So there's a lot more that I could tell you about, but just trust me for now that I can show you that that does not seem to be any select selection of features into classroom that does not seem to be any, uh, uh, that does not seem to be explaining this difference. 
So in Brazil, I'm learning that uh, information or time of interaction uh, eliminates the reliance on priors. Again, I'm not saying that these teachers are not biased. I'm saying that that bias is not finding its way into the evaluation because the technology was improved. Okay? Uh, I imagine that there is some learning by grading. I'm, I'm spending more time with the kid. I'm grading the kid more often, and I learn the, the real uh, uh, performance of that student. This will highlight that we are thinking about this, this issue, or this highlights, this is compatible with the statistical discrimination model. It doesn't rule out taste, but it shows you that there's a good chunk of the statistical discrimination explaining this evaluation bias. One uh, postscript here that's as important, as I told you, it's very interesting that the gender bias that also exists on this day does not disappear with that. It's a very different scenario when we talk about gender differences. And by the way, boys are undegraded, um, also a man uh, throughout. Okay. So finally, oh, look at that. Should I finish now? Is that the, the plan? Um... How quickly can you go through? Uh, I think I can show. You, I, I think you've got the gist of it. So well, I'm flipping to North Carolina now and asking the question: Can I map the bias that I see today to something about the history of these teachers, in particular their first impressions? And what I refer as first impressions is not the first impression of the kid, him or herself, is the first impression of the racial group that kid belongs to. Okay. So I'm really thinking about not you, how you're going to evaluate me uh, after today, given that today is your first impression of me. <laughs> it's really how you're going to evaluate economists, Brazilians after we meet today. It's really how you take this. Uh, this oh, very tall. Uh, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, Brazilians are tall, yes. Yeah. <laughs> so essentially, imagine I, I have the first four years of a teacher career that I can map quite well with this day. So I want to measure evaluation bias in this range, years two, three, and four. And I want to use year one of a teacher experience to be able to have a measure of what the teacher, when the teacher steps into the classroom, the first day of classes, okay, in the system, what is the gap that exists in performance that the students that are coming into that classroom have? So there's legs on legs on legs here, okay? So essentially, I'm taking the first year of teacher experience. I'm not taking the performance after they interact as the performance before they interact. So this is the first day. I step into the classroom, and there is this difference in performance that pre-exists among my students. I'm going to face that during the first year. And that's, that's how I start my first year. I want to know if this gap, which is the nature of this interaction, is affecting the way I see future cohorts of black and white students that I interact with in the future. So I'm not following kids and teachers here anymore, right? So in North Carolina, you don't see this repeat. They, they do not keep having the same teacher over and over. I can show you that there's plenty of variation on black and white gaps happen. So this is the gap on that year one that I just showed you. Uh, well, the gap is really the difference with the 45 degree lines, but this is performance by um, uh, blacks and performance by whites. The difference with the 45 degrees, basically, the, those are blacks outperforming whites uh, and the whites outperforming black, you know, blacks in the system. That, that's the translation of that in the histogram. There's a lot more, okay, better performance by uh, white students, but there is some uh, tale that uh, the blacks uh, overperform the whites. Yeah. Now, yes. Is classroom assignment random? Classroom assignment is definitely not random. What I can show you that, well, I won't show you today, but I can share you with the paper that we did a lot of exercises that now with the teachers, there's not a lot of classroom uh, selective assignment basically because there's very little information about the first or the incoming uh, teachers. Right? The math, I totally believe that beyond that point, they're being assigned. At that point, it's really hard. There is some selection at the school level, not at the classroom level. Okay? Uh, so it turns out at the end of the day, I know, I'm rushing out, as usual. Uh, I have the gap that I showed you before, the gap exists, but I'm trying to tell you that the gap is also a function of that past history. So what you're going to see on column four here is that 
the larger is the white advantage in my first classroom. The more negative I am on evaluating my current black students relative to my current white students. Okay? There's something to do with that first interaction with students that's filtering back into future evaluation. That's showing also the, the last one is just the sign of that difference that provides the same intuition once again. Okay? Uh, in terms of, uh, I'll tell you that. Now, the other thing that is interesting is that I broke this into, let, let me see if this information is so precise or the way this information filters into my future actions is so precise that if I were to break the <clears throat> black-white score gaps in my first year for boys and for girls, am I evaluating the two uh, uh, groups different, uh, differently in the future? Well, it turns out to be very interesting. My current student, boys, black and white, so blacks are under-evaluated. If in the past I had a boy-specific difference in performance, I'm not undergrading boys according to the gaps among the girls in my first classroom. The reverse here when you see the, the girls today. Huh? So not only there's something about my race specific experience in the first year, but there is an interaction between the gender race that I thought was interesting in this data set and reinforces that there's some information content coming from, there's some prior formation coming from that first classroom assignment. Yes. Is, is it a permanent scarring or is there a way for you to tell if people do update? That's very interesting. I do not have enough to tell you that how long it takes for this first experience to die out. What I can tell you is that in that the first three years that I observe, there are no signs whatsoever that this dies out. Can I claim that beyond that point they will eventually learn? I, I don't know. And can you tell whether they switch schools between year one and later years? I, can, I can, yeah. Yeah, because yeah. I mean, I wonder whether it persists even across changes in schools. That's an interesting question. I haven't looked at that. I, I can map the whole professional trajectory indeed uh, and see if that goes with them. I'll wrap up with this. Sorry, sorry for rushing and sorry for taking more than a, my allotted time. But essentially, the other thing that was interesting is that not only the, they are responsive to the average difference, which is what I showed you so far in the first classroom, there's something specific about the comparison of the top and the bottom of the classroom in the first classroom experience, right? It turns out that if I see gaps at the top of my class, okay, the comparison of my best black student and the comparison of my best white student is irrelevant to the way I evaluate my students today. Okay, but there's something about the comparison between my worst black student and my worst white student that filters a lot into how they evaluate students in the future. So I can claim that there's some literature out there that talks about why this is happening. There's some sort of confirmatory bias that literature that can lead me to think this is reasonable, but I cannot prove you any of that. So I am writing the papers trying to stay away from, from that claim. Uh, but I thought was interesting because it's, it's, it's about the specific lower tail of the distribution. Okay? The way I'm trying to convey this message in the text as I write it now, is really about salience. There's something very salient about your worst students in your first classroom experience. I think some of us um, with experience on teaching may relate to that. So the difficult students in your first experience in the classroom may be the ones that stay with you in your memory. So maybe that's what is going on with, with its teachers. Stay, does it stay forever? I, I don't know. I don't know. Is that, sorry, is that a dummy variable for outscoring or? Is yeah, I, I do the, have two versions of this. One is the proportion of the populations that uh, uh, are, are above one or another. So it's right? not so the much. size of the gap, it's just the nature I, of the direction. You, yes, this is just the direction. Okay. The size gives you exactly the same thing. <clears throat> All right, so essentially what I'm learning from North Carolina now is that the teacher assessment is affected by the nature of those interactions. In particular, the first classroom assignment tells you a, a lot about it. So the bias of, against current black students is made larger if I have larger gaps in my first classroom experience. Okay? Uh, and as I told you in the first uh, four years of experience, there's no sign that this is dying out. Uh, and, and I point out uh, uh, that. 
Okay. Um, I promise that I will say that. So let me just in a couple of minutes tell you that there's something that people can do with that. If you are really into field experimentation, uh, this can be a good starting point because now this leads me to think that we could go out there and examine this simple model and the simple results, trying to manipulate those dimensions, either the technology dimension or the dimension of priors. Okay? So if you think about what the folks in implicit association bias literature are doing those days, they are measuring implicit association bias, they're informing people of the presence of bias in what they do, and seeing what happens when people are uh, informed of that uh, implicit association. Folks that did that in Italy, and were also looking at evaluation bias against migrants, uh, found that giving information was uh, making the bias disappear. Right? So that's an idea that you're, you're changing the prior, or you're making people aware of the prior they have so that they correct those. Okay? Uh, there are folks in education that work a lot on uh, experimenting with grading rubrics and grading rubrics improving quite a bit the way you evaluate your students. It should make the role of prior disappear on an exercise like this. So I imagine if I were ever to go to the field and do experimentation, I would probably set this next to each other and see which ones gives uh, the biggest uh, bang for the buck. All right. uh, I won't do that. I'll leave for conversations later, but essentially, uh, I'm glad to keep this conversation going. I'm sorry that this felt rushed. Uh, I told you too many stories in one talk only. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, and it's the first time that I don't do a paper talk. I do all this. Uh, you. Uh, you can reach me out on my Duke. I have a UNC. May I understand? <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I am uh, third floor 3157. Uh, I'm always there. So please come in. Uh, let's have a coffee and have a conversation. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. A little time if we have a few more questions. You don't have a measure of like their actual behavior, but could you use suspension if you have that data in any way to sort of is it is it a behavior? Is it a perceived how good those kids are? I was just I mean, cool to do the same thing with the, you know behavior suspension, but you don't have a measure of actual behavior, right? Yeah, uh, I do not have a measure of behavior that is global enough, but you're right. Uh, so Here's the good news. On the result that I show you that I told you that this control for other things, suspensions uh, uh, are, are in there, okay? Or any disciplinary infraction that is captured by the school system, which again, who knows what goes in there. There's by the way, very good literature on bias on that reporting as well, right? So, which may make you worry about worried about controlling for those as well, right? So if you're controlling, you're trying to evaluate bias, controlling with something that is also bias, you may be messing up. Yeah. But what I can tell you is that this is not going to getting rid of that gap. In fact, in fact, the numbers are pretty, pretty much the same if you have or you don't have the controls in there. Um, what to be honest with you, since you brought that topic up, I don't know enough about. Uh, how good the measures of uh, um, suspensions and expulsions are for elementary school kids. I presume it gets better or at least gets more frequent as the kids age, but but I'm totally speculating. So I, I, I don't know what to make of this uh, suspensions in elementary school for those kids. I, I don't know. Yes? Do you have information on the parents' class status, like their educational attainment? Or there's nothing on that mean data. Yeah. Um, free lunch. For, uh, the the what they call economic disadvantage uh, nowadays. Yeah, we can, we cannot call them free and reduced price line. Uh, um, that's that's the documentation of NCRC tell me that. Um, that's all I have. It is reported in the admin system. That is also um, held constant in the exercise that I showed you. Uh, for the Brazil one, I do have a parents survey that goes home. So I have way more information on parents in the Brazil uh, exercise than I have for North Carolina. North Carolina is entirely using um, uh, data from the you know, NCR to CSD, admin data all. So I'm limited by what they have. Yes? I'm getting back to your kind of 
theory about parents learning about their kids and then making decisions differently. Can you exploit the time structure of when parents kind of like conditional on the first information they get back about the kid, how they make decisions? That's very interesting. Yeah, uh, I would love to do that. Uh, I can point you to a very interesting study in Malawi that they have done. Uh, they basically uh, bumped up the, the information content of transcripts and they did that in a randomized fashion. Mm -hmm. And they found out that there's a huge response of parents, the information content on the transcripts when they were made better in communicating that information. Now, funny enough was not a positive reaction. What they got is that the parents were taking kids that were underperforming out of school in the Malawi exercise. So I guess long story short, I, I do believe that there is this reaction from parents. I don't have great data to follow this return information. I may have in Brazil, now that you, you tell me, I may be able to put that off in Brazil. I'm not so sure uh, that I can, actually, actually I'm sure that I cannot pull that off in North Carolina. But thank you. That's we'll love to keep that conversation going. Yeah, I wonder if class sizes in black neighborhood are larger than class size in white neighborhood. Yeah, so remember that those folks are sitting on the same classroom. So I'm not, I'm looking at the the sample is streamed in such a way that I'm not observing all black or all white neighborhoods in any way, shape, or form. Does necessarily need to be classrooms of mixed race composition. And my results are limited to that, right? So I cannot extrapolate. I cannot, this tells you nothing about the bias embedded on the evaluation of teachers that are assigned to an all black classroom. That, that I have nothing to, to say, unfortunately. This is maybe too weird a question, but in Brazil where there's this common having the student twice in a row, uh -huh. Oh, I mean, is there a point where the student does well and the teacher takes credit for, you know, teaching them the previous year? Like it sort of switches from I'm unconnected to this kid to they've outperformed themselves in some way. I see this from the test and I like them now because they're evidence that I'm a great teacher. <laughs> that, that's an interesting <laughs> That's an interesting take on that for sure. Anyway, I don't know. I mean, I'm not saying it changed uh, your results, but I, I'm just wondering about that I, dynamic. No, I, I, I'm with you on that. Uh, the way I read was not like that. Yeah. The way I read is pretty much like uh, basically imagine a scenario that you step into the classroom and you're told that some um, promotion um, decision was made in the class before yours. And the promotion decision was true lenient, mm -hmm. right? Extremely lenient. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that now you're understanding kids that should not be in this grade are, are yeah. in this grade. Uh, that highlights my priors when I evaluate my students. That's how I imagine this. Now, when I was responsible yeah. for the promotion of that kid uh, from the okay, best right. grade, now I'm confident yeah. that this kid should be where uh, uh, he or she is. And okay. Yeah, that, yeah, right. that filter into last priors. That's right. how I thought about it. Yeah. It doesn't mean that's the right way to think about it. But it's just how it yeah. is. Yeah. Cool. All right. Well, you well, can have the last question. Okay. All right. <laughs> if, if we're thinking about this as kind of a statistical discrimination issue, then, you know, in a sense, yeah, they, so are you kind of thinking about bias in the assessment also being reflected in terms of their like perception of the production function for the kids, right? Mm -hmm. In terms of like, learning and returns to teacher effort. How, like how much effort, effort can I right? put in different kids? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I so, think in, in the same way, I'm imagining that the information filters back to parents and parents invest differentially. You could imagine the same happening teachers. Then now take that evaluation of theirs and decide how much they're gonna invest in their kids. And that's happening that's throughout the year, right? So I'm, I'm looking at one point in time, but that's happening throughout the year. So, so if you were to estimate, say like, you know, so uh, teacher value added for black students and white students separately, like how is that, would that, is that? That would be interesting. Uh, if I were to assign bias level to different teachers, evaluation bias to different teachers, to their value added to black and white uh, students, I may be able to show you a correlation between the two. 
I, I'm not sure if I can pinpoint cause and effect, but that will be an interesting correlation to have for sure. Yeah, no, thank you. That's, that's an interesting and more work for me. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, this is great. I'm glad there's so many people involved. If you um, are virtual, you can, of course, email Marco if you have questions. Uh, so thanks, everyone, and we'll see you uh, next week. Yeah. All right. Thanks. Thank you so much.